20, verse 21 to 23. Yes. Let us begin reading in Matthew chapter 7, verse 21. Now everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? In thy name we have cast out devils. In thy name we have many wonderful works. Verse 23. And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Let us pray. Let us pray. Loving Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you. Lord, we praise you. Lord, you gave us this time. Lord, you are the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Lord, we deserve our worship and praise. Lord, we also hear, need to hear your voice today. Lord, I confess I'm a man of unclean lips. It is not within me, Lord, to feed thy people with the spiritual food, the manna that comes from above. Lord, you come into our midst and you speak to us. You strengthen us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Not sure why God led me to the scripture portion here. I'm sincerely not clear what God has for us in, in this uh, scripture portion. Uh, but I, I'll try to be as faithful as I can to the scripture. Uh, the, some of the notes that I took out from uh, Charles Spurgeon's uh, notes on the same scripture, I was inspired to go along with that. Uh, the, the title of my sermon for today, I'd like to call it, uh, Does He Know Us? Does he know us? Here we see that there are many, many people who come to Christ and say, have we not done this? Have we not done this? Have we not done this? And Jesus looking at them saying, I never knew you. I never knew you. In that context, let us ask ourselves this question. Does he know us? Does he know us? It says in John 17, verse 3, the Lord's Prayer, Jesus Christ telling, and his prayer to God the Father. Now this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. So knowing God means eternal life. It also seems to me that God knowing us also means eternal life. God knowing us means eternal life. If you turn with me to John 10th chapter, verse 27 and 28, we have that as a memory portion. Uh, it says John, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. That is our master's voice saying, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, I know them. Second Timothy 2, 19 says the same thing, that the Lord knoweth them that are his. 2 Timothy 2.19 says, The Lord knoweth them that are his. This knowing, God knowing us, is a very special thing. The word here, know, from the Greek, if you look into it, the Greek word, ginoskos, means to know at a personal level, at an experiential level. It is not like you know the name, like we all know, resident of a country. And we know many luminaries, many, many prominent men in this world. We all know them by name, but we may not even know what they like, what they don't like, how they sit, how they stand, how they eat. We don't know anything about their personal life. Knowing is to that level. And God knows us intimately. He knows us. Does He know us? When our Lord is talking about these people, He says, Many, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord. If you look at that word, many will say to me in that day, there's something very profound our master is telling us here, that many will say to me in that day, in that day, that's a very special day that the Lord is talking about. That day is when we all stand before the judge. It is the day of judgment. To me, it appears like this is the day of judgment for unbelievers. But we all 
have a judgment. Those who profess to have faith in Christ and those who are true believers, the true believers also will have a judgment day. They stand before Christ. There is the believer's judgment. And there is a great white throne judgment where all people, all people alike, the great and the small, as it says in Revelation 20th chapter, great and small, the mighty, mighty rulers of this world, like uh, Napoleon, like the, the most prom, most famous, most powerful man on earth, and the most menial person on earth, standing on the same ground in front of their God. The most wicked and the most noble, they stand before God. On that day, there is a day that is set aside. That day, many of us have a good reputation, and it says in, in Proverbs, a good name is better than precious ointment. And yes, we all strive to get a reputation for ourselves before men. We want people to respect us. We want people to like us. We want people to think, of, think well of us. And there is nothing wrong in that. But we have to remember that when we stand before God, we are not standing before ordinary people. Ordinary people see the exterior. They may be, they may be impressed by our piety. They may be impressed by our character. They may be impressed by our, our conduct in life. But when we stand before Him, who is far better than any x-ray machine that you can find. He can see you through and through. He can take the inside core of you outside and expose you. As it says in Hebrews 11, Hebrews 4 chapter verse 13. Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, for all things are naked and open unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Yes, we are fully exposed before our judge, before our God. Are we willing, are we willing to come to this point to search ourselves to see whether we are acceptable before God? Yes, in the light of eternity, in the light of this judgment, how do we conduct ourselves upon this earth as we walk upon this earth? There are many ambitions of life that we have, and it is good that we need to have ambitions. It is good that we need to work hard. It is not wrong to, to work towards the promotion at work. It is not wrong to store up wealth for the, your family and for the next generation. It is not wrong. It is not wrong to have pleasures of life. But in the light of eternity, in the light of the fact that we stand before God, are we able to look back at our life and to say, I have lived a life that was purposeful, that was God honoring. And you have a satisfaction about your life towards the end of your life. It says in Hebrews 11 verse 27, it is appointed unto man once to die. Yes, it is so true. The Latin phrase, memento mori, memento mori. Remember that you will die. That is true. We all face death. It is true, we all know that. But if you look at the lifestyle of people that we find, it doesn't seem like they are anywhere near this fact that they are preparing for their death. No. Even when you ask a man who's 70 years old, he will tell you he is nowhere near his grave. Say, I still have 30 more years to go. There is still a long time. I remember two Sundays ago, I was driving to the airport and I was trying to witness to the taxi driver. He was telling me, why do you talk about God and all that? Don't you realize when we die, we die and be no more. You are educated. Don't you understand this? I was trying to tell him. I could not bring him to understand that he will have to stand before God 
even though I tried in my meager, my, with my little ability to grant, to give him the gospel, I was not able to let him understand the consequences of passing through this life, passing through death, and to face God. It is true, we all face death. Says uh, Warren Parker wrote a poem. It says, uh, a hundred years from now, let me just read that poem to you, a hundred years from now, he says, uh, there are so many things that we worry about today, but a hundred years from now, none of these things matter. None of those things that you value so much, you cherish so dearly, you strive for, you have such an ambition for, those things don't matter. He says, it will not make much difference, friend, a hundred years from now, if you live in a stately mansion or a floating river skull, maybe that you're living large in a big mansion, or maybe in a small, filthy river boat, if the clothes you wear were tailor-made or just pieced together somehow, if you eat big steaks or beans and cake a hundred years from now, it's not going to matter. Won't matter what your bank account or the maker of your car you drive, for the grave will claim all your riches and fame and the things for whom you for which you strive. There is a deadline that we all must meet. None of us will show up late. It won't matter all the places you have been. Each one will keep that date. We will only have in eternity what we gave away on earth. When we go to the grave, we can only save the things of eternal worth. What matters, friend? The earthly gain for which some men will bow, for your destiny will be sealed, you see, a hundred years from now. Yes, a hundred years from now, it will not matter how rich you were, or how poor you were, how great you were, how much wealth you amassed, how popular you were, only matters what you have done for Christ. As C.T. Studd says an oft-quoted statement, is only one life and will soon be passed. Only what is only what is done for Christ will last. Yes, friends. We face the judgment. We face death. We face God. But see here, our Savior, our Master, is talking about at least five kinds of people. To five kinds of people, he's saying, I never knew you. I never knew you. What are those five kinds of people? So the first type of people are those who say, Lord, Lord. They call Lord, Lord. It's almost as if they're saying, yes, we are Christians. We are your disciples, Lord. But you see the, the phrase, they use it repetitively, repetitively. Our master was talking about that and he said, when ye pray, be not as a heathen. But they have vain repetitions and they pray. Vain repetitions. Vain repetitions. It says in Matthew 6 chapter. Uh, verse 7 it says, When ye pray, use not vain repetitions as a heathen do, but they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. Yes. They may be owning him as Lord, but it is vain. It is only as deep as their profession. It's not any farther than that. I remember when I was a student, uh, we used to have Bible study, and my pastor nearby used to come and conduct Bible study for us. One of those days, he actually opened up for prayer after the initial introduction, and then there was one I think it was a brother, not sure. He was actually, he started praying. Started praying and he started, Lord, we worship you, Lord, we honor you, we adore you. In time when he was praying, he was praying. And then he started saying, Hallelujah, Sotram, Hallelujah, 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 Sotram, Sotram, Sotram. Long, long pause, and then again he started, Hallelujah, Hallelujah, Sotram, Sotram. Then the past, the preacher got tired of him and said, Amen. And then he started, let's go on to the next thing. You <laughs> see, there is, there's something about vain repetition. It does not does not edify anyone. There are those people who profess to be disciples of the Lord, but their profession only goes only that far and not any deeper. 
Those that are without, God judges. Those who are outside of the church, God judges. But those that are within, they are supposed to judge themselves. They need to judge themselves. Lest they come to a false security, lest they come to a point where God will say to them, I never knew you. It is a terrible thing to hear our master, our Lord, to say to us, I never knew you. The second kind of people are those who prophesy in the Lord's name. Because many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? Yes. There are many who are willing to prophesy in the name of God. Yes. These are people. I do not mean to be judgmental on anyone here. I hope there's no one here. I praise God that people that we are, that we are in, I'm in touch with and in our fellowship here do not have the craving for prominence. But there are those who prophesy and preach because they want to be on the pedestal, because they want to be seen, because they want to have the prominence. There's a man of God who said, I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of God. In Psalm 84, verse 10, there's a great man of God who said, I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of the Lord. Not so with some. They need to be up there on the pedestal. James 3, verse 1 says, Be not many masters, knowing that we are subject to the greater condemnation. I mean, don't many of you aspire to become teachers? Because if you are a teacher, you are subject to a higher level. Your judgment is based on a higher level, not at a lower level. You need to be careful when you are preaching because you, after having preached to others, might be disqualified. It says in uh, 1 Corinthians 13 chapter, so I preach with the tongues of men and of angels that have not charity. I become a sounding brass and a tinkling cymbal. Yes, it may be possible that we have such great eloquence, such great eloquence that people are spellbound. When we preach, there are thousands of people who come and we preach. They, they are amused, they are entertained and so they come by the thousands sometimes. Might be able to say, that day, Lord, when I preached, thousands of people used to come to hear me. The Lord might say, I never knew you. Might be, might be saying, I am well known in my city, Lord, because I was preaching. The Lord might say, I never knew you. You might be saying that you are nationally known. The whole country knows you because you are a preacher. God might say, I never knew you. <coughs> Zach Turner talks about it. He says that when he was called to Australia back in the 70s, as a young man, as he went to preach there, the local newspaper there wrote about him and they said, we have not heard a finest preacher <coughs> preaching on any podium in the world. That was a news article about Brother Zach in the 70s, I think it was in the 70s. And he kept that newspaper extract, the, the cutting cut out of that newspaper with him to remind to himself that he is such a wretched man that people on the outside are able to praise him, but he on the inside was not worthy of any such praise because he had a consistent life at that time and he did not want any glory from men. He wanted the glory, the approval from God. Yes, Paul also said, having preached to others, I might be a castaway. Yes, we need to be careful, those of us who preach, we need to judge ourselves to see whether we are acceptable before God. Are we at a point where God is going to say, I never knew you? The next kind of people that our Lord talks about are those who 
had remarkable success in casting out demons. It says, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name have cast out devils? There are those who are able to cast out devils. Now, mind you, these are people who are standing before God, before God who is able to see your heart inside out. They are not bluffing to God. They are telling facts. These are truths. These are people who were telling God, we have cast out devils. And to those people, God is looking at them in their eyes and saying, I never knew you. How terrible that is. There is a, a man who professes to be a man of God with such a great power that he is able to cast out devils. And you can see it. The effect is dramatic, sensational and spectacular. God is saying, I never knew you. How can it be? How is it possible that there is such great power revealed in a human being and God is telling him, I never knew you? How is that possible? See, it is possible <coughs> that God will bless us with success in our ministry. It is possible. It is possible that God can bless us with success. It is just because we have success, it does not mean that we are renegades. It is not we are uh, Apostate, apostates? No, not really. You see, sometimes God may choose to bless us. A.W. Tozer says that he says God may allow success to his servants when he has discipled him to the point where that servant does not need success to be happy. Let me say that again. God may allow success to a servant, to his servant. When God has trained him, has discipled him to a point where that servant, that man of God, does not need success to be happy. Yes. The man who is happy, the man who is joyful when there is success, and who is cast down, desperate and dejected and downcast by failure, is a carnal man. At best, his fruit will have a worm in it. He does not bring forth much fruit that is acceptable before God. If you are, are happy when success comes and you are sad when failure comes, such is the, the, the plight of a carnal man. He does not amount to much in terms of bringing fruit for God. But there are people who are successful who was spectacular and those are the people God is saying I never knew never knew you there are people who who show this in a dramatic fashion you can see it on the stage under the camera TV camera they have a show many famous people they they show this healing ministry they show it to their self glory they say, I have done it. They might say, this God did it through me. But through me, he did it. You see, there is something special in me. That's why God is doing it through me. And they publicize it. They glory in it. And yes, it is true. Something spectacular does happen. But that does not mean that God knows that person. Yes, there are some others. God is talking about fourth kind of people. That Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have cast out devils. And in thy name done many wonderful works. Yes, the fourth type of people. They have done many wonderful works. Yes. They are working night and day. There may be people who are industrious, working hard. But they do the sensation, sensational. It's a, it's a, it's a mind-boggling act when they do it. When you look at it, you say, oh, what a great man of God. It's a wonder when you look at it. The way they work, it's a wonder. They are in the ministry, working for God, doing great miracles, many wonderful things. God is looking them in the eye and saying, I never knew you. What a sad thing. There may be some of us who say, I am not that prominent. I, 
I never go to the pulpit. Don't know how to preach. Never cast out devils. I don't do anything spectacular. No miracles or wonderful works that I do. I'm very faithful to the church. I am there. Sometimes I'm on the pastor. We are the only set of people in the church sometimes. I'm there whenever there is a special event in the church. Whenever the church has a rally, I'm rallying with the church. I am faithful. But I do not do any of those spectacular things that we talked about. But yes, even those of us who are just mere lay people in the church, even to them, God is telling us, Whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them not, I will liken him unto a foolish man which built his house upon the sand. Yes, those of us who are faithful and regular in church attendance, in church activity, in religious work, religious rituals, I mean. We have heard Christ. That is, that is to the people, those are the people to whom our Lord is saying, you, whosoever hear these sayings of mine, you hear my sayings, and if you do not do them, I will liken you to a foolish man. You have to remember that there will be rain, there will be floods, there will be wind, and the house that you built will be swept away, and great will be the fall of it. Our master is saying that these are the people who he never knew. Yes. Some of these people, these set of people that our master said who he never knew, are those who maintain their character and candid conduct for a long time. Yes. It is true that today's the business world, when a business is going bankrupt, they can hide that fact for a long time. No one knows that business is bankrupt until after they have applied for bankruptcy protection. And they continue the business too. But there is that sense in which there some of uh, these people are who profess to be Christians and yet they're bankrupt inside. We have heard of church scandals many times, have we not? There was this man, this great televangelist, they are held in high repute and respect by the whole nation and perhaps overseas. He was caught with a disproportionate amount of wealth. He was caught and they were wondered what I never thought somebody great like him would do such a thing. You falling prey to filthy lucre? You are a man of God. How come you fall down so low? And then there, there are those who people find out there's a national level we've seen uh, somebody who was uh, found to be gay because his partner came out and spoke out in the open. And the whole church wondered, <coughs> grieved. What a, what a betrayal. There are people who were caught in adultery. There is no purity in some of these people. They were caught, some of those, we, the, in the church scandals. But how about us? What is the difference between us and them, some of us? Is it the only difference that they were caught and we were not? Is that the only difference? Oh, let us examine ourselves. It is, it is important, it is essential for us to understand exactly where we stand before God. Many times when people are engaged in such an inconsistent lifestyle, it appears that God is not doing anything about it. Doesn't seem like it. There is justice. Why is it that God is not silencing that person who is engaged in such an inconsistent lifestyle? Some of us are caught, but not all of them. Like these people here, they, it had to come to that day, the day of judgment when they were exposed. It had to wait until their death when they were exposed. These people were talking to Christ. Lord, we did great things in your name. Until the very last day they did great things. And they were before God. 
Why is it God is silent sometimes? Well, we know our God is merciful. God is not slack, as some men count slackness, 2 Peter 3 9. But is long suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Yes. Our God is merciful. He is patient, he is kind. That is why he is not allowing such a thing as a great destruction. He does send great destruction, supernatural destruction sometimes. And it says some men lie before them and some after them. And it says in Second Timothy. Second Timothy. God chose to punish Sodom and Gomorrah because their sin was so great. But some of these people, I have to be cautious, they believe that they are right. Otherwise they wouldn't be talking to God and saying, Lord, have you not prophesied in thy name? Lord, have you not cast out devils in thy name? They thought they were right. How is it possible that they were on the wrong track and believed till the end, till the end that they were right? Is it possible for, for uh, somebody who is engaged in spiritual work, the work of God, to think that he's on the right track only to find out after he dies that he's on the wrong track. How is it possible? It is possible to some extent, but it is possible that they refuse to see the light of what they're doing. In Hitler's time, the general, one of his generals, Goebel, said if you, if you repeat a lie enough times, it becomes truth. If you repeat a lie enough number of times, it becomes truth. That's probably what they were t telling themselves. That yes, they were in the ministry, yes, they were working for God, yes, they have rewards in heaven. Not willing to see the truth of what is in their lives. It is possible. But what Bible said is not true. In the kingdom of God, the lie is always of the devil. It can never be light. It can never be true. God brings to light the hidden things of darkness. Always. In the kingdom of God, a lie is never a truth. But you see, our master is giving a reason why he says, I never knew you. And he says, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have you not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have cast out devils? And in thy name done many wonderful works? And then will I profess to them I never knew you. Ye that work iniquity. He says that there. You are calling me Lord, Lord. But not everyone that said that to me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven. That is verse 20. Is it verse 21? Verse 21, Matthew 7, verse 21. He says, only those who do the will of my Father, which is in heaven, only they will enter the kingdom of God. But as for you, you are telling me you've done great and wonderful works in my name. But I want to tell you that you are those who are a Lord to yourselves. You define what is right and what is wrong by your own standards. You are men of lawlessness. You workers of iniquity, if you translate that from the Greek, it, some of the modern translations have it, men of lawlessness. Those who define what is right and what is wrong, depending on their own convenience. They define it according to their own convenience. They are not following the law from God. They want prominence, but not holiness. Not obedience to God's word. Not obedience to God's law. That is why God is telling them, I never knew you. And they said, Lord, Lord. They're saying they're disciples of Christ. Only the disciples of Christ have the term Lord. is a term of endearment. Dear term. Loving term. Lord. 
the people who profess him to be Lord and do not follow in his footsteps are not truly his disciples. His disciples are those who follow in his footsteps. And that means to go to Calvary, to hang on the cross. It says about the Son of Man, came not to be ministered, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. It says in Romans 12, chapter verse 1, you all know that verse. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. A living sacrificial life. That is missing. Yes, that is missing in these people's lives. See, they want prominence but not humility. When you see them talking about why they should go into the, into the kingdom of God, the reasons they gave are very strange reasons because they contradict the word, word of God. They said, we have prophesied, we've done prominent things, we've done great things for you, and so we need to be your disciples, we need to be part of your kingdom. But our Lord said, now take heed that you do not your arms before men to be seen of them. Otherwise, you have no reward of your heaven, which is in heaven, or no reward of your father, which is in heaven. In Matthew 6, chapter verse 1 and 2. Therefore, when thou doest thine arms, do not sound a trumpet before thee, as the hypocrites do, that they may be, they may have glory of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. Matthew 6, 1 and 2. Thou, when thou doest thine arms, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. Do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. When you have good works that you want to perform, let them be in secret. Don't be ostentatious about it. Don't declare it. Don't have a drumbeat telling, listen, listen, this great man is doing something great for all the community. He is donating something big, something great. You have such an attitude. You want prominence from people and you already got it. When it comes to prayer, he says, and when thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are. But they love to pray standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. Yes, there are people who, for the show, for the glory from men, are doing this prayer. They already got their reward. Yes. Talking about fasting, he said, when you fast, be not as the hypocrites of a sad countenance, but they disfigure their faces, that they may appear unto men to fast. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But thou when thou fastest, anoint thy head and wash thy face, that thou appear not unto men to fast, but unto thy Father which is in heaven, which is in secret. Thy Father which sees in secret shall reward thee openly. Saying, when you do acts like this, they need to be secret acts. When you pray, it needs to be secret prayer. You have to have humility about you. Yes, a thousand sermons do not equal one genuine prayer. This is Charles Spurgeon quoting. A thousand sermons do not equal one genuine prayer. You might have a great outline a sermon that you have prepared, preached, and you had the audience dismayed at your eloquence and at your clarity of thought, but it does not equal genuine prayer before God. Yes, we need to we need to make sure that we are not like one of these people. We all, all of us, <coughs> those who are prominent in the church, those who are not, need to examine ourselves to see whether we are at a point where we know God. Some of the things that we need to avoid <coughs> when we are in, the, in this condition is to avoid the risk of having a religious character without a renewed heart. You don't have a renewed heart, but you have the outside religious character. It's a risk, it's a danger. Doing the work of God without being really born again, it's a great danger. And having the, the words to say, the right words when men of God ask you questions, you exactly know what to say. They call it church theology. 
Church theology, you know exactly what words the church uses. The key phrases, you understand them all. You are able to, to impress and to cover the eyes of the people. We need to be careful about such things. We need to be holy. Holiness does not wish to be seen. We need to come to God on His terms. It says, not everyone that doeth, that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father. Yes, our Father's will is what we need to do. And some of the people, John's, John's gospel said, what is the will of God? Jesus explained it. The will of God is that you believe in His Son, Jesus Christ. Believing in Christ. Believing in Christ is important. Our God is a God of mercy. He's a God of mercy. If you as a sinner come to Him, Lord have mercy on me, you will be justified. That is where the repentance and faith come into picture. To have that true repentance and true faith. It says in Psalm 103, verse 10, He has not dealt with us after our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. For as the heaven is high above the earth, so great is His mercy to attempt that fear death, to fear God. It says in Psalm 31, verse 7, can somebody read that? Psalm 31, verse 7. Yes, yes. Here you see, this is a man of God telling, Lord, you know the distress. You know my adversities. This is the Lord of the true believer. When there is trial, when there is trouble, he runs to God. God knows your trial. God knows your struggle. God knows your distress. He knows you. That is, that is the, the true character of a true child of God. God knows. God knows. He knows those who are poor in spirit. There may be some who would say, Lord, have you not done great things? And God may say, you, I never, never saw you come as a beggar to my door. Never saw you come as a beggar to my door. Never saw you sitting as a disciple at my feet. Never saw you following humbly in my footsteps. Never saw you as a sheep that heard my voice and followed my voice. That is why he says, I never knew you. We are humble. We are faithful. We fear God. We know Him. But more than that, He knows us. He knows us. It says uh, Lamentations, we all know this verse, chapter 3, verse 21, is it? It is of the Lord's mercy. This I recall to my mind. Therefore, have I hope. It is of the Lord's mercy that we are not consumed. Because his compassions fail on yeah. His compassions they fail on Mercy is great. John Newton wrote this poem. He said, Dost thou ask me who I am? Oh my Lord, thou knowest my name. Yet the question gives a plea to support my suit with thee. Once a sinner near despair, sought mercy seat by prayer. Mercy heard and set him free. Lord, that mercy came to me. As our Lord is a Lord of mercy. Not for us, for him to know us. We need to be humble. We need to be under the radar of this world. 
We cannot be ostentatious. We cannot be pompous. We need to be humble so that he may know us. He knows us when we come to him as a beggar to his door to beg him for mercy. He knows us. When we sit at his feet in prayer, he knows us. He deals with us. He tells us the secrets, as it says in John 15 and 15. John 15 and 14 says, Ye are my friends, if you do all that I have commanded you. Henceforth I call you not servants, for a servant knoweth not what his master doeth. But I have called you friends. For all things that I have heard of my Father, I have made known unto you. Yes. He makes us, He knows us, He gives us secrets, He tells us wonderful things. Does He know us? Shall we pray? Loving Father, thank you and praise you for your grace and mercy. Lord, that you have been working our lives, and those of us who do not have the assurance of salvation, may they have it, Lord. Lord, may we not live in an illusion. May we examine ourselves to see where we stand before you. And that, Lord, by your grace and by your mercy and by your power, may we live, may we live victorious lives, holy lives, that bring glory to you. And that you might know us, that we might know you. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen.